Good morning and welcome to the third of our four session series on rent stabilization. Today's event is looking at lessons learned from other areas and other parts of the country that have implemented rent stabilization policies. So as part of our four part webinar sponsored by the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and Urban Land Institute, Minnesota, we're pleased to bring you three presenters from different parts of the country. Kicking us off this morning will be Matt Brent. Matthew Murphy, we have two Matts today. Matthew Murphy, second will be Matt Brown, and the third will be Sybil Hebb. Matt Murphy is the executive director of the New York University Furman Center. Previously, he served as the deputy commissioner for the Office of Policy and Planning at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. He considers himself an urban planner working at the intersection of housing policy, affordable housing finance, and land use. Matt will start us off with a conversation about New York City's rent stabilization policies, and then he will be followed by Matt Brown. Matt Brown is the general counsel for the Berkeley Rent Stabilization Board. Matt Brown has been an attorney with the Berkeley Rent Stabilization Board for the last 18 years, and he started his career as a legal services attorney and the executive director of a San Francisco nonprofit organization serving Spanish-speaking tenants where he helped to protect vulnerable tenants from displacement and worked collaboratively with landlord groups, other tenant organizations in the city to ensure that rental housing was well-maintained. Our third speaker today will be Sybil Hebb. Sybil Hebb comes to us as the Director of Legislative and Policy Advocacy at the Oregon Law Center a statewide nonprofit law firm providing free civil legal assistance and access to justice for low-income Oregonians. Prior to her policy work, Sybil practiced law for Legal Aid Services of Oregon, representing low-income individuals in landlord-tenant domestic violence and family law cases. So Matt Murphy will start us off talking about New York City. Matt will come in talking about Berkeley's more recent city-based rent stabilization policies. And then Sybil will introduce us to the work that's been happening in Oregon around their rent stabilization policies. Each of our three speakers will start off with some introductory remarks, and then we'll turn to a moderated conversation of the three panelists. I encourage you to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A available to you at the bottom of the screen. And with that, I will turn it over to Matt Murphy to start us off with an introduction to New York City's policies. Terrific, and thank you, Libby, for the kind introduction um, into ULI and Minnesota's Fed um, for, for having me. Um, I am really thrilled to be here. I welcome all questions, and I am really honored to be on the panel with um, Matt Brown and, and Sybil. Um, and I'm gonna just kick us off talking a little bit about New York City's kind of unique context. Um, uh, just to give some background. So in New York City, we have about 2.1 million um, uh, housing units or rental housing units. And it's really made up of four components. We have about a million private unregulated units. We have about a million rent stabilized units. We have 175,000 public housing units. And then we also have this other component that's really critical um, that I would call income restricted affordable housing or affordable housing. And it layers into rent stabilized housing, which doesn't where we can't get a, a great count on the number of income restricted affordable housing units. Um, but what it means is that we have a um, not just a blanket requirement of rent stabilization across all of our rental housing. Um, in fact, within our rent stabilized housing, it's also incredibly diverse and also large in scale. As mentioned, it makes up about half of New York City's rental market. Um, the stereotype that you saw in movies growing up probably is like rent control, um, you know, the like $300 um, gr grandma unit. Um, and that uh, is really not the case anymore. There's only 16,000 units left of rent controlled housing out of uh, the 2.1 million units. Um, rent stabilization is really what I'm talking about today. And that really applies for us um, on buildings built before 1974 that have six or more units uh, subjected to state law. We also rent stabilize though, almost all new housing that gets built. So um, there is um, a lot of luxury housing or high cost housing 
that because they participate in a property tax incentive that we have for new, new rental housing, those units are rent stabilized. Um, also all new low income housing that gets built or income restricted housing um, is also rent stabilized. So again, we have a, a, a lot of composition, a lot of different types of housing in our rental stock. And then within our rent stabilized stock, we have um, you know, some key differences. Um, it's a fluid stock as well. It's estimated that between 1994 and 2020, about 320,000 units deregulated out of rent stabilization, and we added 170,000. Um, we also had some fairly dramatic changes recently. In 2019, our rent laws changed. We'll talk more about this, but they changed in a way that made it uh, you know, impossible to decontrol units. It eliminated ways to increase rents and eliminated or reduced some ways to, for um, building owners to do capital repairs in exchange for higher rents. Um, and it's so, you know, we have this older system since 1974 and actually going back to World War II era, but we also have these new and complicated provisions in place, which are really critical. Um, then just to give you a sense of the actors involved to make rent stabilization here in the city work, um, the first issue is that the quality of rent stabilized housing is worse than unregulated housing. We know this from a housing and vacancy survey that our, our city does every three years. Actually, they just came out with findings this week. 23% um, of renters reported more than three deficiencies in pre-1974 rent stabilized housing compared to 8% in unregulated. So what we do is we spend all of our CDBG funding on code inspectors. We have about a thousand housing maintenance code inspectors in the city. Um, we also build a lot of housing. It's probably not enough, uh, but we build about 25,000 new units a year, about 30% of which are low income housing. To do this, we have multiple city, city agencies, um, 400 underwriters at our city agencies, putting together tax benefits, zoning benefits, et cetera, and capital loans. Um, we also spend all of our private activity bond funding um, for the most part on um, low-income housing built in New York City. We also preserve a lot of affordable housing. Um, we have a whole preservation team that works with building owners to keep it in affordable programs. And then a lot of enforcement done through our state's housing agency, the attorney general's office, housing court, small claims court. There's a whole task force that gets involved um, on issues as well. And then finally, a key contributor um, is our rent guidelines board. We have nine members who get together every spring. They're all named by uh, the mayor. Five are public members named by the mayor. Two are tenant um, members and two are owner members or owner reps or tenant reps. They're supported by a small staff that produces really great reports every year. The RGB gets together multiple times in the spring. Um, they have hearings, they show the reports, and then they make a vote. They determine how much rents can be adjusted for New York City's rent stabilized renters. That all happens uh, right now, actually. We're, we're right in the midst of that. So I'm going to stop there and hand it over to Matt Brown. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Libby said, uh, I've been with the Berkeley Rent Fork for about 18 years, um, uh, currently a general counsel. Um, I'm here to talk to, to, to you today about uh, Berkeley's program, which is a very strong form of rent control. Um, I will, in my comments, when we get to the moderated session, talk a bit about the difference between um, more passive rent control and a more active rent control like Berkeley has. Berkeley... Um, this is going to sound puny, um, given what Matt Murphy said. Um, for New York, uh, we have about 20,000 fully controlled units. Uh, our ordinance began in 1980, so um, relatively old for uh, what you all might think of rent regulation. But certainly, when you look at uh, programs like New York, it's a, a we, we are we're fairly new. Um, and so we have about 20,000 fully controlled units. And when I say fully controlled, I mean uh, that there are basically four pillars of our ordinance. Uh, of course, rent control, uh, and then rent registration, meaning that we register all the rents uh, in the city, um, and then uh, security deposit interest, and then of course, eviction protections. Um, we have about 5,000 partially covered units. There's a state law that prohibits California cities from uh, rent controlling 
uh, newly constructed units. Uh, and for purposes of our ordinance, newly constructed units are anything built after 1980. So uh, some of those newly constructed units are getting a bit old, but uh, we are prohibited by state law from uh, actually uh, rent controlling those units and uh, single family homes um, and condominiums. So there's about 5,000 of those in the city that are partially covered. Uh, and when I say partially covered, I mean that rent controls do not apply to them, but uh, rent registration, uh, security deposit interest, and um, eviction protections all apply. Uh, we are a separate agency from the city. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that we're a special fund department. We uh, derive all of our fees um, from, a, uh, uh, from a, a landlord registration fee. Uh, and that supports our staff of about 25. Um, and uh, we have an elected board. Uh, that board has parallel authority to other elected officials, including the city council. Uh, the umbrella of our jurisdiction, of course, is a little bit more limited given that our nine member elected board uh, only oversees the, uh, the rent program. And uh, that elected board um, also sits as an appellate panel because we are a quasi-judicial administrative agency. So when uh, somebody has a dispute regarding their rent or when somebody wants to adjust the rent, um, be it a landlord wanting to adjust it up or a tenant wanting to adjust it down, um, we have uh, hearing examiners or administrative law judges who hear those cases and issue decisions that are uh, binding uh, regarding the rent. And then if uh, any party disagrees with uh, those decisions, they're able to uh, appeal that to our board and they sit in appellate capacity uh, in order to do that. And again, they are all elected um, either every two or four years. Um, I'm looking forward to the moderated um, portion of this. I'm going to keep my, my, uh, my comments now very brief, and I'm going to pass it over to Sybil. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I'm Sybil Hebb. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm with the Oregon Law Center out in Oregon. I'll keep my remarks brief and go quickly through a PowerPoint because I wanted to outline the provisions of Oregon's statute, which is very new and uh, relatively unique as a statewide uh, policy proposal. Um, so Oregon's um, statute has been in place since uh, 2019, uh, right prior to the COVID crisis. And it was passed uh, according to the same backdrop as many of you are confronting, which is uh, an escalating housing crisis that was impacting both rural as well as urban areas. Oregon is a state like many states that has an extreme split of some relatively condensed and urban areas uh, and, and many, many rural areas, some of which were rated as the least affordable markets in the nation. The small town of Grants Pass, which only had 39,000 inhabitants at the time was the second most uh, least affordable uh, housing market in the nation behind Miami in 2019. Um, so we were really seeing a significant statewide crisis. The backdrop of our crisis informed the backdrop of our comprehensive response. And as you can see on the screen, uh, we have taken a policy as well as an investment approach um, of the policies Rent stabilization, which is coupled with just cause eviction in Oregon, is really the only tool that we have had that was able to have immediate effect, and that has been a significant benefit um, to all of us. Uh, the bill in Oregon that passed is Senate Bill 608. Uh, prior to passage of that bill, there was nothing in place that was protecting tenants from significant and sudden increases, and we were commonly at the Oregon Law Center seeing our clients come forward with significant uh, rent increases that were the functional equivalent of eviction. And that led to a significant impact that we saw in our clients' abilities or willingness to bring fair housing claims, to ask for repairs, to assert uh, their defenses and their rights against retaliation. Um, there was a real culture of fear. Um, the 
Bill, I will summarize briefly and say, I, I think it's important to uh, differentiate it from the amazing examples in Oregon, as I mean, in New York, as well as in Berkeley. This is really a rent stabilization provision. It's an anti-gouging provision. It is not a rent control provision. Um, its coverage is statewide, every unit in the state, unless it's exempt. Uh, I'll talk about the exemptions. Uh, the bill provides that there is no rent increase allowed in the first year of tenancy. And after the first year, the rent cap applies of 7% plus the CPI, which in Oregon is defined as the 12 month average for all urban consumers in the West region. Uh, we randomly basically picked uh, September as the date that we would use. That was somewhat informed by the fact that there's a 90 day notice of increase required for all tenants in Oregon. And that allowed uh, us to publish Publish in uh, by September 30th uh, what the allowable rent increases would be for the coming year in January if landlords wanted to start giving notice uh, right away. So um, the Department of Administrative Services determines the cap. It's set by statute, but they calculate it um, and they publish the maximum and allowable rent increase uh, for the coming year. That's the only government function in the administration of Oregon's statute. Um, the exemptions are simple. One is for, and it's a rolling exemption for new construction uh, for the first 15 years past the first certificate of occupancy. And then some affordable housing rent increases are exempt. I would note that this initially was a blanket exemption for all affordable housing. We narrowed that exemption after some problematic experiences. And now the exemption only uh, is applicable if an increase is required by program eligibility or if the increase does not uh, impact the tenant's portion of the rent. There is vacancy decontrol in Oregon across the state. The rent cap doesn't apply in between tenancies so long as the tenancy was not ended through no cause notice in the first year of a tenancy. Um, notification is again, relatively minimal. Uh, the Department of Administrative Services publishes the amount, they send press release and they maintain it on their website. Um, the landlord is required to give notice to tenants 90 days prior to the impact uh, or effective time of a rent increase. And any landlord that is giving a rent increase that is above the cap and is exempt from the cap must include facts supporting their eligibility for exemption in the notice that they provide. Um, the enforcement burden is solidly on the tenant. There's no, again, no office, no administrative oversight, no, uh, no government enforcement. The tenant must raise a proactive claim in court or must assert a defense uh, in an action for non-payment or uh, a demand for rent. Generally, this has to be done within a year of the claim arising. That's a significant burden. Uh, it's scary. There's a lot on the line for a tenant to raise uh, those claims. And really the ability to raise those claims depends upon access to counsel and understanding of what their rights are. So those are two significant challenges that we can talk more about. The consequences of a violation are if a tenant prevails in court, they're eligible for three months uh, rent as a penalty and any actual damages plus attorney's fees. Uh, and it's a defense to an action for possession. Um, it's coupled with just cause protections we think that's incredibly important. Those two provisions apply together. If you don't have either one of them, then either a no cause notice or an extreme rent increase can displace people summarily. Uh, so that's why they go together in Oregon. And I think I'll turn it back to the panelists um, so that we can talk a little bit more about lessons learned. Look forward to it. Thank you, Sybil. Thank you, Matt and Matt for your introductory comments. So as we've seen, there are various structures of rent stabilization policies, various governance components that are in place between New York, Berkeley, State of Oregon. I'd like to ask all of you, what makes for a successful rent stabilization policy? Recognizing that you can define success however you think best. And Matt B, I'm gonna start with you because in our introductory conversations, one of the key points you've made is the importance of embedding a rent stabilization policy into the fabric of the community. 
So how does that play into making a successful policy? Yeah, thanks Libby. Um, the two primary differences between rent control um, uh, jurisdictions is uh, a complaint driven um, form of rent control in which uh, um, the, 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 there are laws that exist um, and hopefully um, people know about them, but people don't access their rights um, um, un unless somebody makes a complaint about a violation or unless somebody makes um, a uh, request to have a rent adjusted. Uh, our form of rent control is a much more active form of rent control. We are in constant communication with the community and indeed with um, everybody who is affected by our law. We have a number of different communications throughout the year indicating to everyone in the community what their rents are, that's both landlords and tenants, what they can go up to and so forth, and a number of different um, um, uh, community fora uh, in which we have um, education and outreach um, for both landlords and tenants and realtors. Uh, they play a big role um, in, in rent control as well because they're often um, uh, exchanging properties that, uh, that are affected by the law. So we believe in Berkeley that in order to, um, as Libby said, sort of weave it into the fabric of the community, that we um, have a very strong presence and that is very upfront, um, essentially, about the way that uh, rents are regulated so that everybody understands their rights and responsibilities under the law, and that it's not just sort of uh, they're sort of sleeping um, and then it wakes up when somebody activates it. Matt, um, how would you answer the question for New York? What makes for a successful rent stabilization program and how does it fit into the broader context of other policies you reference? Yeah, I think it's such an interesting question and I think it's kind of fair for me to be like, um, I don't know what the first few years in, in, you know, of rent stabilization in New York City was or like. And I imagine they were really difficult um, sorting them out. Um, but I can speak to the 2019 changes. You know, I think that there are some keys. I mean, one is that it fulfills the intent of the law. Um, you know, I think Sybil points out so that, you know, to like a 12% increase for some folks is not really like that helpful, um, you know, um, it, or might not feel like it fulfills the intent of the law, um, you know, and vice versa, if, it, if, you know, all small landlords exit the market, you know, the, there's just, it, 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 you might have a changing composition that you have to deal with as a result of the law. And so you need to adapt and you need to evolve. And I think that that's kind of something that, um, you know, real estate does <laughs> and, and, and ultimately this is affecting it. Um, I also think it's really important the economics do work. Um, you know, the really kind of glaring examples of where rent control failed are around that. It's the withdrawal of units um, and leaving them vacant because they don't make economic sense to rent. It's the um, non-investment in the housing stock and creating disparities there when you want it to actually give stability to people. Um, it, it, that stuff matters and incentives do have to be in, aligned. You have to think of it holistically with your tax system. And then, of course, clarity um, to the people that should be benefiting to, to rent stabilization. A lot of people in New York City are not aware of renter rights in general. Um, rent stabilized renters are kind of a mixed bag. Some know the law in and out. I mean, it, extraordinarily very connected. Um, others might just not be aware. Um, and, and that takes time. And, and frankly, you know, it's a very hard law to interpret. <laughs> um, and you need a lot of explanation on the, the websites of the various enforcement agencies. Um, and then also, I also think like, it's very important that leases make clear what, um, what the actual provisions are. That's ultimately a regulatory document that matters a lot. We have regulations that require the font size in leases um, and what has to be included in the lease. And I think that's ultimately important because, you know, that is kind of like the note that people hold if you equate it to a mortgage. So, um, but there's many more, um, including a, a really holistic approach across agencies. 
um, and using it as a tool, not a solution to your affordability programs. So Paul, what would you say makes a successful rent stabilization program or policy? Thanks. Well, I agree with many of the uh, uh, comments that have made thus far. And uh, I think it's really important to think holistically and any aspect of a provision will have impacts that can also be mitigated or addressed. And all of those things are important to, to think about. I think Oregon's uh, statute is so new, uh, it took uh, a effect, uh, I believe it was February 28th of 2019. Um, so was in effect just a little over a year before the COVID pandemic hit. And of course, the last two years have been, you know, uh, I've never heard the word unprecedented so many times. So I think we are still learning what we have to learn from our policy. What I think we can say fundamentally statewide that our lawyers saw in offices across the state in both urban and rural areas is that we saw a noticeable difference in the experiences that our clients were having. Um, and so, you know, we saw less fear, we saw less immediate displacement by extreme rent increases. And so that's not the same thing as regulating or mitigating rent prices overall statewide, but it does have a noticeable impact on the people who were current tenants at the time who had less fear about being summarily evicted uh, by either a no cause notice or uh, an extreme rent increase. And as that Murphy said, um, a 12% increase to someone living on a fixed income uh, is, is the functional equivalent of, of an eviction, and a 100% increase is, 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 is even more so. Um, but I guess my underlying um, fundamental observation just in response to your particular question is that from Oregon's perspective, statewide regulation is a valuable tool, um, and I'm glad that we have our law. I do not think it is a substitute for more specific and comprehensive uh, approaches at the city or county level um, and administrative enforcement and education and outreach, um, helping people to understand all the nuances of their rights and their obligations is, uh, is, is vital. So I'd say that. One of the themes that each of you has touched on is the mix of complementary policies that need to be in place to help rent stabilization succeed. Sybil, you've mentioned just cause eviction. Matt Murphy, I was struck by New York City's array of housing financing strategies and code enforcement to make something like this work. So could each of you speak to what you see as key complementary policies that need to be in place? So Sybil, you're smiling. Can we start with you? My immediate answer is uh, is that just cause eviction is really um, a necessary pairing with uh, with rent stabilization. And as I've said, but it bears repeating, uh, a no cause notice that does not have any allegation of tenant fault uh, to which the tenant has no defense is is a, is you know, it's just contrary to all of the belief that we have in due process and uh, and to any notion of tenant stability and the ability for tenants to plan for themselves, for their children, for their jobs, for their education um, is just undermined by the existence of no cause notices. And if you don't have that protection, even if you do have functional rent stabilization, all of those goals can be undermined by the simple issuance of a no cause notice. So those two things I think are really critical pairings. Um, I would also say that uh, landlord registration and administrative uh, some function by which a tenant can access or to, can file a complaint, can access some sort of oversight. Um, unless you have right to counsel in every single case, there's no substitute for administrative oversight. And I'm sure there are lots of others, but I'll turn it over. Thank you. Matt Murphy, do you wanna take on the complimentary policies? Yes, um, and I will say to um, that, you know, I think New York City is, has historically been perceived as an outlier, but I see a lot more cities moving closer to like the comprehensive approach um, just in the last you know few years, even maybe prior to COVID. Um, and so I think there's a recognition 
or there, there's kind of a temptation, I guess, to, to view it as like daunting. But I think the reality is it's also a, a maturation process that the city has gone through. And, you know, politically, New York City is a city of renters. Two thirds of our households are renters. It's always been this kind of fluid, um, opportunistic place. But I, yeah, I think, you know, the comprehensive policies I think are, are really critical. Uh, to a certain extent, rent stabilization is, it's not easy at all, as we've made clear, but it's also kind of like, it's, it's establishing the game. You know, it's establishing the boundaries of what the um, allowances are for renters. But there's a lot more to be done, obviously, um, beyond that. Um, so like for us, rent stabilization gets justified um, every few years when we do a housing and vacancy survey. And just this week, the results came out. We're in a stat, our loss defines us as being in an emergency housing shortage. It has since, you know, the mid 20th century. The response to that is to, to build, uh, build new housing. You know, and that's obviously controversial, um, but the reality is that we have, th th through zoning provisions, through property tax exemptions, financing with low-income housing tax credits, even using our bond financing, our capital funds and, and taxpayers um, paying the debt, you know, we have accomplished a lot to be able to do specifically low-income housing. And I think the supply of low-income housing is really critical. It's not just that it's, you know, obviously important to meet the current housing needs, it's also high quality housing. And, you know, I, I think the, the concern over rent stabilization or rent control is the absence of investment in property. Um, and that is the case um, in, in many properties in New York City. <laughs> um, and, you know, it takes a lot to enforce those. It's actually very hard for our tenants to, to bring cases to, um, to make repairs and we have an array of emergency repair programs that are really important. Um, but, you know, in the very big picture, um, it does require, I think, people to be kind of acknowledging that, you know, we are able to take advantage hugely of the Community Reinvestment Act um, in a way that because we have so many banks located here where they are, you know, investing in, in community development programs and a lot of that is in affordable housing. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, I, it's largely been, you know, successful, in, but we still have a lot of issues and that's where code comes in. So I, I really would view it as a combination of, you know, enforcing rights, enforcing code provisions, um, but continually investing in the stock. And that's both going to be in, in through new housing um, and, and new affordable housing, of course, and also figuring out how to get capital into these properties. Um, you know, our, there's a market around rent stabilized housing here. It didn't collapse in 2019 when we had a HSTPA pass. Um, but you know, it was, it was a hit. It was targeted at deregulating properties. Um, but we have a lot of work to do on our kind of hundred percent older rent stabilized properties. They need capital. They need, um, improvements. They need to also uh, comply with local energy laws and, and carbon reduction laws of which they're not really equipped to right now. So it's all to say it, it's, it's all going to be a local flavor, but it's also like an opportunity to build a comprehensive housing policy, you know, around where your rent kind of stabilization parameters fall. Thank you. Matt Brown, I want to take you or give you the opportunity to talk about my next question first, which is the different governance structures between Berkeley, New York City, and Oregon. So Matt, you're working for an elected rent stabilization board. How does that governance structure play into the implementation of the policy? And then Matt Murphy, think about the appointed board, civil, the statewide approach. So Matt Brown, elected board. So yeah, the first thing that I would say is, is that an elected board is going to be um, one of the first steps to a very strong form of rent control. You, um, it, many rent control departments are divisions in larger departments, uh, generally planning or housing. Uh, 
And um, as such, they have um, sort of less attention um, given to them by either appointed or elected officials. And so an elected board is going to uh, promote a much more, um, um, uh, at least in California, um, a much stronger form of regulation um, that is designed to, uh, you know, to promote um, uh, fair and decent housing and to uh, prevent displacement of those that are most vulnerable. Just to crib a little bit off of um, the last question, I just wanted to, to say that, it, that, that if you do have a, an elected board, it is important to try and harmonize city services. Rent control is uh, but one of a very large universe of um, laws that promote uh, affordable housing and uh, community stabilization. And so if you have other departments that are um, working uh, not in a harmonious way with that, then it becomes a little bit less successful of a program. If you have a law that allows the building department to uh, you know, green light uh, um, um, demolition or substantial rehabilitation, which displaces tenants, then rent control is, is far less successful. And I just really want to reemphasize something that Sybil said earlier, which is that um, rent stabilization and eviction protections, whether you call them good or just cause eviction protections, are, ex are, are key. You, 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 can't have, you can't have a successful one without a successful the other. If you don't have eviction protections, um, but you have rent control, then somebody can be evicted when the landlord wants to raise the rent because there's because um, almost all states um, uh, require decontrol at this point. Um, so I guess I, the, the thing that, I, getting back to your question, Libby, um, the, 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 uh, what having an elected board uh, allows for is a real focus on rent control as an incredibly important piece of uh, the community uh, stabilization process. Matt M. Yeah, and I was a little busy um, responding to one of the questions or to the questions. So um, Libby, if you could remind me. What does it mean to have an appointed rent stabilization board? Oh yeah, of course. Um, well, so, <laughs> Our, we have a nine person rent guidelines board appointed by the mayor. Um, their core role is to vote on annual rent adjustments. Um, they make it a vote um, and it's a, one argument is that it's a reflection of the politically elected, you know, official, the mayor of who, who who elected them into office and what they want to see. Um, the other side of it though, is that the rent guidelines board um, does a lot more than just kind of every year say, this is a 1% or 2% um, increase, which I'm not sliding at all. And I can talk more about that, but they hear a lot of testimony. Um, they are, um, they're making a discretionary decision. Um, they're kind of like the Supreme Court of rent, rent stabilization increases. Um, you know, so I, I think that having an appointed board by the mayor um, to do that is, you know, helps fulfill what their, what their mandate is. There's a structure obviously where there's five public members and two tenant reps and two owner reps making a lot of the kind of, um, focus on the public members and who chooses them. And, you know, there are a lot of criteria around who can be a public member. They're not allowed to own rent, any rent stabilized housing. So that, that criteria is, is really important to establish. So the, you know, the advantage is that they are making a discretionary decision. And so when you have something like the pandemic, for example, you know, there's no data available to deal with that. And they decided to basically do a rent freeze. Um, so, you know, but that's a that's an outlier. But you know, in the years of huge fuel cost increases, there's a, a lot of advocacy to have higher rent increases, and they they're the ones to make that determination. So I think it you know it works for New York City. I think there are some issues, but you know it 
it is a it's a representation it's a broad group making a determination after looking at a lot of data hearing a lot of testimony it's very important in this process for our tenant advocate community to be able to organize around something as well um, which they do every spring simple can you speak to having the statewide policy and then shall we say a light governance structure Thanks. Um, so just a couple things uh, pinging off of what uh, Matt and Matthew uh, were saying, just as a grounding, um, you know, I think um, Matt, Matt Murphy talked about New York City being largely renters. Um, you know, the state of Oregon is 42% renters. Um, but I think in both urban and rural areas, we know that that percentage is increasing, right? You know, the cost of housing, the cost of home ownership, access to home ownership is increasingly out of reach. And so, you know, even if it's slightly less than half, it's a significant, you know, it's a huge chunk of our, of our communities who are renters. And we know that they're disproportionately low income people, they're disproportionately people of color, women, people with disabilities, seniors. And so, you know, the this is a population that has been suffering displacement um, disproportionately and summarily with sort of generational traumatic impact. And so I think it's important to, to think about what the impact is on the market and on landlords Absolutely. And we need that impact or that input in, in determining these, these policies, but inaction is not an option if we care about equity and we want to prioritize stability of our, of our renter communities. So I just think that sort of as a backdrop, which then is sort of a contrast to the fact that we don't have an administrative oversight in, in looking at these uh, the policy that Oregon has enacted. And I think because it's at a statewide level, that was the right choice for us at the time. We, we didn't have the ability to have that larger statewide infrastructure, but I think it would be a missed opportunity if a county or a city were considering these policies and did not take the step of ensuring that there was uh, an administrative body. Um, you know, I think about Oregon and, um, and uh, you know, Matt mentioned COVID, um, we've also had just significant wildfire impact. And some of that impact was very much on urban communities. And if we had had the ability to take specific localized steps to respond to that immediate uh, housing crisis where rents went through the roof, suddenly, you know, tens of, uh, just tons of units were, were just removed from the market because they were destroyed. Um, and so, you know, having a local ability to respond to crises as they come up is, uh, is invaluable. Um, I'll just say one other thing, which is that in, in absent that, what it means for a tenant in Oregon if a landlord is violating the rent cap is that they have to ask themselves, do I pay this rent even though I know it's illegal, if they know it's illegal, um, and, and, and if I don't, I risk the threat of a non-payment notice of termination in which I suddenly have very short timelines that are at play and and may end up in the you know the risk if I'm wrong or I can't find a lawyer to help me with that case may end up in my uh, displacement and a negative uh, judgment on my record. So that's a threat that we work hard at legal aid to um, reduce. Uh, but I think administrative oversight can play an important role in reducing that threat. Thanks. We have a quick clarifying question from an audience member. So could each of you just briefly say what the rent increases that have been allowed in each of your jurisdictions over the last year or two? We'll, we'll start with Matt B, then Matt M, then Sybil. For this year, ours is 2.1%. And that's for fully controlled units. And our, and our rent guidelines board is meeting right now. Right now, there's a proposed range that they've set, which is two to four percent. Um, in the last year, eight years, it's been closer to zero to two percent. And then historically, it's all over the place. <laughs> um, kind of a political representation of the political nature of it. 
So Libby, just real quickly, ours is hard coded in the ordinance uh, at 65% of the consumer price index for all urban consumers in the Bay Area. So it's um, while the, our elected board does um, um, uh, vote on that every year, unlike Matt, the what Matt Murphy is describing as as a deliberative process, um, it is it is mainly you know me looking at the Federal uh, Reserve um, and or rather the the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, and just seeing what that num number the delta is between uh, June of the previous year to June of this year, and that becomes the um, um, uh, the annual general adjustment is what we call it, the, the, the rent increase. And it's, it's, it, 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 it provides um, a lot of uh, sort of, it, it takes any kind of politics out of the decision. It's just an economic indicator of inflation. And Sybil? Well, Oregon's is similar to the city of Berkeley's in some ways, except that it's just much, much bigger. Uh, and so there's no po political uh, calculus. There's no voting. It is specified that it's the change from September to September of the uh, uh, consumer price index for the West Coast uh, added to 7%. So 7% uh, plus that annual change in the CPI. And uh, for this year, that's 9.9%. Uh, that in and of itself, I mean, it protects against extreme spikes, but if, you know, year over year, people living on fixed incomes, very low incomes, you know, the cost of housing is increasing, uh, that's a substantial increase uh, that, that can be unsustainable. So, um, but 9.9% is, is this year. And, you know, we're very worried about next year because the inflation change over, you know, this current year is going to be big and we're worried it's going to be double digit uh, increases that will be allowed. So that's a downside. So at this point, we have about 10 minutes left. I would like to ask each of you to think about what advice you have to localities who are considering rent stabilization policies. And in particular, we have a question from the audience, an audience member, who is wondering about the trade-offs between simpler, more predictable policies and more complex or tailored and specific policies as a specific trade-off. So advice that you would have for localities considering rent stabilization policies. Matt Brown. My first bit of advice is that no policy should be complex. Um, the, the considerations for adopting a policy should be complex, but when, when you're writing laws or regulations, it's really important to make them digestible for the community. And so to the extent that people are thinking that, um, that this is going to be some kind of a puzzle um, that is only accessed by a few, I feel like that is a big, uh, that's something to avoid. Um, obviously the considerations that go into this are layered and complex, but the law that emerges should be something that you can describe to anybody in the community um, and should be applied in a way that is um, easy to understand. Oh, Matt M. I'll go next. Yeah, I I agree with Matt Brown. Um, I think the deliberations should be very complex, um, and I think they are uh, here. Um, but it, it, it there are a lot of it's a complex. <laughs> Um, thing to regulate. It's basically regulating the way people live. Um, and it, you, there's all sorts of scenarios that you, you will never anticipate <laughs> where you will have to ask is that, you know, should the law weigh in on that or should that be, you know, the courts? Um, and, you know, and I think that's just also like the maturation and, and evolution that will just go along with it. It's, a, it's kind of a living policy. Um, I, um, you know, I think that y you, you, we were just talking about inflation. Um, you know, I think it is very important to look at kind of the historical trends of kind of rent increases as best you can in the community. Um, just getting a handle on you know, what has been the case and what is the case for different components of the housing stock. 
I would put it as it's very important to set parameters and then work to mitigate risk. So if there's a lot of risk people are kind of feeling is introduced to the equation around losing new construction or losing investment or losing um, you know, energy retrofits or whatever it might be, that's where it has to be kind of treated as a holistic, comprehensive approach um, as well. So I'd think about where those major risk points are and what you can do to head that off. I don't, I, I agree wholeheartedly that anything that is passed needs to be simple and understandable and workable for the folks who it's designed to protect and also who, who need to implement it. Um, uh, and, and I echo, you know, support the other comments as well. I, I think though, it's also important to remember that um, don't let the enemy uh, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, we have a situation right now in most communities across the nation where displacement is, is happening at awful rates with significant negative impacts on individuals as well as communities. And we know that rent stabilization is one thing that can work to help ease that trauma and that, and that, that impact. Um, and so, yes, it's important to think about how to get it as most right as possible and to think about it in a larger context so you can think about the other ways to support development and the ways to support um, other, other um, aspects of this housing you know, crisis that we have. But I, I, I encourage action because um, rent stabilization is one of the only tools that we know of that can have immediate impact that staves off further harm. Um, so uh, I'll throw that in there. Thank you. We have time for at least one more question. And this one is coming in from an audience member. You've talked about um, how, what the impact has been on the housing market in your areas. So the question is how, when rent stabilization policies came into effect or in New York, have been adjusted in 2019, what has been the impact on both the housing market itself, as well as tenant stability or housing quality, all of the mix of pieces you've referenced? What have you seen as some of the key impacts? Well, <clears throat> I mean, when New York's case, you know, we, we, the decades of the 70s and 80s um, and early part of the 90s when rent stabilization was you know in place and kind of coming out of rent control policies you know there were trends that were affecting the city that you know you you can't point to rent stabilization uh, devastation of um, jobs we've lost 600,000 jobs um, and lost population um, and recovered. You know, 1993 is actually when New York City put in more decontrol provisions, put in more market provisions around rent stabilization. The, the effort there actually was around many high-income households benefiting from rent stabilization, and they, they undid some of those laws and allowed deregulation. I would call 2019 kind of a um, the changes a, a pushback on what happened in 1993. Um, and so it's, it's very hard to be specifically, like this was the exact impact on, on the market because there's just so many components going on that, you know, you, you couldn't look at rent stabilization policy and say New York City, you know, was devastated by it in the 90s because we had a huge amount of population growth and incredibly high um, long-term price appreciation, even in rent-stabilized housing. So, but at the same time in 2019, you know, in a very limited time period, we did see effects um, in terms of building permits and and um, property values uh, the, for sold properties, property amount of property sales. Um, we saw it specifically on the deregulating stock, the 25 to 75% stock 
you saw more of those. Uh, you saw evictions, filings fall there, but you didn't see actually some of the same trends for the 100% regulated buildings. Um, and so that, that there's a question too about like context. I think it's more about how to think about the impact of the policy on different segments of your housing market. Um, and, you know, it's so it, it's kind of easy to point to like very immediate impacts, but like in the very long term, you know, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of demographic change and, you know, demand and globalization really um, that makes it very difficult to answer but you know it's obviously important to monitor it you know and i think that's part of our rent guidelines board uh responsibility is to every year get together and say okay this is what we're seeing this year um and that's that's what they do sybil or matt what you've seen is the effects housing market or tenant stability effects I'll jump in. Um, I uh, I think it's really uh, I think we have to be really cautious about drawing any statistical conclusions uh, about Oregon, given that our law passed just a year before COVID hit. Um, and I really think that any study that that purports to you know have a strong conclusion um, should be uh, we should be skeptical of that just given the the, the breadth of the impact that that COVID has had on 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 really everything um, but uh, I guess I for whatever it's worth um, and I think it's worth a lot I we have you know 40 some lawyers who are working in communities across the state who do nothing but interact with tenants every day and with tenant organizations and what is just unequivocally the case from the stories that we're hearing and what we're seeing in community is that you know there is less immediate displacement that for which tenants have absolutely zero defense and that's just uh, never. That's just an incredibly good thing, in my view. And um, and and I think it is important, as as all the speakers and all, and the questions are are getting at. It is important to think about all the other aspects um, of a policy, and, and that's always true. And and it's hard to get any one policy perfect. But I think without rent stabilization, it's absolutely clear that the situation is not perfect. And it cries out for response, especially because of what we know. It, it, it's just indisputable that the housing crisis and the eviction crisis is having a disproportionate impact on people of color, communities of color, individuals of color, and others. And, and, and how can we know that and not act, I guess? Matt Brown, last words. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on something Sybil said, um, and and just um, uh, you know, rent control at its base is about community values. Um, what does the community want to promote um, as far as protecting folks um, that would otherwise be vulnerable to displacement, um, either by extreme rent hikes or um, by eviction for um, without cause? And um, we have um, a wealth of experience to show that. When rent control works, um, uh, there have been a number of studies that show that schools improve, that parks improve, that services improve, when people are in, are in place longer. And any concerns surrounding profitability of rental housing should be somewhat extinguished by the fact that all good programs are going to have, or all programs are going to have some kind of fair return um, aspect to them. And if they don't, they will be, they will be stricken down immediately. Um, so for us, the California Constitution guarantees landlords the right of fair return. Every single rent control jurisdiction in California has a mechanism whereby a landlord is able to um, um, achieve a fair return if he or she is not. And so it's really important to understand that some of the concerns surrounding that, you know, that are, that are, that are commonly uh, pitted against rent control before they start um, are really sort of uh, um, exercises and in intellectual, um, you know, intellectual conversations that have happened and have been disproven. Uh, so if you are um, um, wanting to provide uh, real protections uh, for community members that otherwise would be vulnerable from leaving that community, 
uh, it's really important to establish a strong system uh, to protect them and then to allow for landlords, obviously, um, to, um, um, you know, to adjust rents um, if and when uh, um, th those rents are, are, are necessary to adjust. Thank you all. And now I'll turn it over to Stephanie Brown for some closing words. Thank you to all of you, a really valuable conversation. I wanted to let all you know, we have one more session left in this series. It will be on June 8th, so Wednesday, June 8th from 11 to noon. And that is really going to look at complementary or alternative policies to rent stabilization. A lot of these have come up over the course of the series, just cause eviction, different zoning changes, how to increase supply. We're gonna dig into more of those. Shane Phillips, the author of The Affordable City, will deliver our keynote. And then we will be joined as well by uh, Dr. Tina Stacy from the Urban Institute, who's doing deep research on both rent stabilization and inclusionary zoning. And Michael Spots from ULI's Terwilliger Center, who recently released a report on stabilizing renters, stabilizing cities, and how to look at that. So the three of those uh, excellent speakers will form our core panel to really dig into how do we think about what we need to come around or what could more effectively deliver some of these goals. Uh, to our communities. Thank you so much to our panelists today. I appreciate all of you all for joining. The recordings from the last two sessions are live and the registration for the fourth is live as well. So uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you so much.